We know about conventional Western banking, but what about Islamic banking? Well, Islamic finance is a system of finance that affects many countries around the world. It has a very different set of philosophies and rules that are interesting to observe and learn about. This is the topic of our conversation with our next guest, Ibrahim Khan, who is an expert on Islamic finance, having studied this topic in his master's degree in the UK. Prior to that, he did his BA at Oxford University, and he currently works as a venture capitalist. Prior to this, he worked as a financial lawyer in the UK, and he also made the Forbes 30 under 30 list in the finance category. Ibrahim Khan, welcome to Kitco. It's your first time. Pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be on. All right, we're going to start off with a primer on Islamic finance. Not a lot of people, including my Muslim friends, even know what this is. So uh, it's a different form of banking. It's a different system of finance. Just as a, from a 30,000-foot perspective, Ibrahim, give us an overview of how Islamic banking is different from Western banking. Yeah, so the, the key thing in, in Islamic finance is that there's a few no-nos. There's a few big no-nos. There's uh, interest is not allowed. Um, you're not allowed to have excessive uncertainty in transactions. So, for example, gambling or spread betting would be problematic. Um, and then if you have um, if you have Mesa, something called Mesa, which is just pure gambling, uh, that would be hugely problematic as well. Um, and so there's uh, I guess practically what that means is that for Muslims in particular, whenever you have an aspect of finance that usually would involve interest, Muslims have to think about it carefully and structure it in a way that makes it work. And typically that involves um, using some kind of rental um, you know, structure to make it work. Um, I, I, I think I, I, at one point in a video um, mm -hmm. long ago, I gave an example of how, to, how you would buy a pencil yes. if you don't necessarily have enough money to buy this pencil. So let's say the pencil is worth $10 and you only have $5. And for that additional $5, you could either um, take a loan out from your friend and get that $5 and say, and your friend says, pay me back $10 in, in a year's time. Um, now, he doesn't care what happens to the pencil. That is not his pencil. He just cares that he gets back $10 in a year's time. Mm -hmm. Under Islamic financing, you would say to your friend, friend, can you buy this $5 bit of the pencil with me? And now we're shared owners, for example, in this pencil, and I would actually rent the pencil, your proportion of the pencil from you. So I use the pencil, but I will pay you back, let's say, um, $5 in rent over the course of the next year for your proportion, and I'll buy it back off you. And so economically, we end up in the same position, but risk from a risk perspective, the, the, the friend that was using Shuri compliant financing, he was actually taking an ownership risk in the pencil. So if anything happened to the pencil, he would actually end up losing out. Mm. So at heart, it's about sharing a lot more of the risk and to some extent the reward. So a few follow-up questions on that. For, first of all, so let's take the uh, um, let's take that example of the pencil. You're borrowing from a friend. Now, in the first option, you said that you could take out a loan, a $5 loan from your friend, and you could decide just in private terms when to pay him back and how much. Let's say you default on this loan. What is the legal recourse of that? In, his, so, in an Islamic uh, finance country, yeah. Okay, so I mean, in in an Islamic finance in an Islamic country, when you're dealing with Sharia compliant finance, um, if you default on a loan, you would look at like any financing agreement. You would look at the contract and see what are what are the you know the options when it comes to recourse. And ultimately, you would end up um, asking the person if they don't agree to pay pay you the amount back, then it would go to the courts. Now, the key difference in the recourse is usually there would be a penalty interest that is added onto the amount because you've yeah. been delaying and delaying and not paying, right? In Islamic finance, um, if that penalty amount is paid to the person, that's hugely problematic because then you're, you're, you've got interest entering into the mix. Uh, but at the same time, um, your typical Islamic bank doesn't want people to be abusing them and just delaying the payment and not getting anything, you know, in in uh, as a as a downside. So what well, the way they structure it is, they will actually take that additional interest, that is the penalty payment, and they will give that away to charity uh, because they're not allowed to take it. But at the okay. same time, they don't want that moral hazard where people are, yeah, people are just abusing the system. 
Well, you said that the the other option is for the bank uh, to take partial ownership of the pencil or whatever asset you're you know uh, applying a loan for. Uh, I wonder if the application process would be different from, let's say, a Western bank. Suppose I go to a bank and I ask for a line of credit or a, or a loan. The bank would evaluate my financials and determine whether or not I'm fit to repay this loan and you know charge me an interest based on my uh, credit score and credit history and whatnot. Uh, in this case, they're evaluating my project. They're evaluating certain things. From an investor's point of view, I, I guess the evaluation process will be different. Is it more stringent, you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the uh, at least this is the the theory, David. You know, sometimes in practice, I think you can end up um, you know having very little similar, very little difference between the two um, conventional Islamic. But the theory is that because the Islamic bank is taking an equity risk in in that investment, they really care about what you are doing with that pencil. Like, are you trying to run a business with that pencil? You're going to make some money, so that allows you to pay them back. You know, what is the uh, value of that pencil? Is it worth ten dollars or not? So they right. really care about that stuff, and and that's really beneficial from a economic perspective because you know we saw in the 2008 financial crisis the the downside of irresponsible you know inadequate due diligence when it comes to lending decisions um, and with islamic banks they actually did not get hit pretty much at all by the global financial crisis just because due to the restrictions that are placed on them by islamic law they weren't allowed to you know buy and sell um, the credit default swaps that you know caused the whole financial crisis uh, in the first place so um, I think there's some really interesting, beneficial things from a macro and you know overall economy structure. Okay, um, I want to touch on uh, where this applies in just a minute, but I want to also first ask you about uh, uh, applications for the consumer. So let's suppose um, in an Islamic country, and we'll get to that where that is exactly. How do I apply for a credit card? Do those exist? Yeah, so credit cards do exist in some uh, some places. Um, and the the way they would um, they would they would work is it would essentially be um, either a charitable project. Sometimes you know Islamic banks they offer credit cards uh, with very you know with zero interest just because they want to acquire acquire customers. So that could be an option. But then often they do make a profit on it, and they are you know it is equivalent to the you know typical credit card. And the way they structure it is something called um, murabaha where you are, um, let's say you're buying, um, I don't know, um, a TV and you're buying a TV for $100, uh, but you don't necessarily have that $100. So what the bank would do is using this credit card, the bank has essentially bought that credit, that TV for, uh, for okay. you for $100 and it marks it up and it sells it to you for $120. But now you have to pay them back that slowly in deferred payments. So in essence, the bank becomes like this middleman that uh, that you know has bought from the wholesale, marked it up a bit, and sold it to you. So basically, I have to report to the creditor what I'm going to use that credit for. I can't just apply for a line of credit, have the bank give me twenty thousand dollars USD, for example, and then just do whatever I want with that. So, um, in in actual fact, David, you can. I okay. was kind of giving you the I was giving you the example. Um, to you know, bring to light the exa- the underlying you know rules behind it. Yeah. But what Islamic banks do is they say that look, here you have twenty thousand. Go ahead and purchase for, a, for on our behalf whatever it is that you want to do. And as long as you pay it back within a certain period of time, great. If you don't, then you're going to have to pay this additional amount, which is where this murabaha agreement kicks in. So um, that's kind of you know practically it's it's identical to your typical credit card, but behind the, uh, behind the kind of um, infrastructure is slightly different because of that. Okay. What about mortgages? So if I'm applying for a mortgage for a home, uh, you know, in a conventional mortgage, uh, I think there's, look, if I apply for a mortgage, the bank, the bank technically could take ownership of that home if I default. If I foreclose, that's the bank's asset now. Is that the same for a, an Islamic bank? Yeah. So in an Islamic uh, mortgage, it would be very similar to shared ownership schemes that you might see. Certainly in the UK, we see them. I don't know how it's like in Canada and the US. Um, But what happens is that you would own perhaps 20% of the house because you've put down 20,000 
pounds deposit on a hundred thousand house, the bank would own eighty thousand pounds of that house because that's their ownership. So uh, you would then rent that eighty thousand portion from the bank, and um, you would obviously pay less than market share, market rate rent because you already own a portion, right? And so the idea is that over time you are buying the bank out slowly, and you are um, paying rent on the portion the bank owns, and that rental portion is going down over time until eventually you fully own the house. So what, what does rent mean? Isn't that just, it's not interest, it's rent. It's rent because the bank actually owns the house. So on the lease, on the agreement, on the freehold, on the title deeds, right. is actually the name of the bank on it because they are the majority owner of the house. And okay. they are letting you slowly buy that back from them and also live in the house as a, as a tenant. Well, one could argue that that's just a you know legal definition. It's technically like interest, is it not? I think it's a it's a fair point. I think the the key difference comes down when um, there's damage done to the house. Okay. So you know if if you are um, a conventional bank and you know damage is done to a house, technically the loan that you are owed by the individual still exists. It doesn't matter that the security has been destroyed; the loan still exists. Uh, the person may not necessarily have the money, but if they do, that you know you, you jolly well will have to pay them back. In an Islamic bank, the um, the theory goes that you won't have to do that because the asset has been destroyed, and therefore there isn't nothing to be you know paid back in that sense because the mm -hmm. the the interest portion was actually rent, but because the house doesn't exist anymore, there is no rent. So the, the loss is borne by the Islamic bank. Now, it's important, David, to note that within the Islamic finance world, there is some internal tension because a lot of the larger Islamic banks, they often look to you know, try and hedge away as much of this additional risk that comes with Islamic financing in, in particular, so that you know, for the ordinary man, they actually say that, you know what, it looks exactly like the, the conventional model and the bits that you were supposed to share the risk on, you've hedged that away using insurance. So actually, you know, there is no difference. And I, mm -hmm. and I am sympathetic to that view. So there's that internal tension within Islamic finance as well. I suppose the rent you pay on, on, on your house, it, it doesn't depend on the prime rate more moving up and down, right? Because it's not an interest rate, it's not a variable rate. Let's suppose you get a variable rate. You know your mortgage payments differ based on the prime rate. Uh, but here, let's say the interest rate goes up, your yeah. rent still stays the same. It's fixed, correct? Um, it can do. So some Islamic banks and some shared ownership schemes do that. Um, but with some Islamic banks, they actually do peg it to some kind of prime rate or base rate. Okay. And the reason why they they do they do that is because um, probably two reasons. The first is regulation, because often uh, you know, these home financing uh, companies are heavily regulated and regulators like to see it um, pegged to the base rate. The second reason is because consumers sometimes get confused because if consumers are used to things being equivalent to the base rate and now there's this entirely new model, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very hard for them to compare between apples and oranges so that's why uh, Islamic banks even sometimes peg, peg their returns to the base rate. Okay. Uh, what about for the institutional side? Well, forget the institutional side for now. Let's say I, was a, I were a retail trader, a stock trader, and I want to trade on margin. Is that allowed? Uh, no. So um, if, you, if you're trading on margin, if you're, if you're uh, in effect um, either getting given a loan by um, the, the, the stockbroker that's um, that's potentially problematic if you are having to uh, repay it with interest. If you are simply borrowing interest-free um, from a third-party source and you're using that to you know trade with, that is actually fine um, because you know that's nothing to do. You know, you, all you've done is you know you've taken interest-free loan out and you're trading. Now the problem with a uh, with a stockbroker giving you that interest-free loan is that the stockbroker is only doing that so that you can trade with him. And so he is inadvertently a condition of the loan is that you trade with him and give him the spread and give him the additional fees. Um, so that is seen as interest. So that's not allowed. Um, and if you are um, you know, going into things like um, short selling, where you're um, buying and selling borrowed shares, that is not allowed as well, because there are specific rules that you 
you mustn't buy and sell that which you don't own. So you have to own the thing that you buy and sell. What about derivatives then? Technically, I don't own the underlying, it's a derivative. Yeah, so derivatives are um, pretty much not allowed um, unless there are specific reasons. So, you know, certain kind of forward or option agreements would, you know, would arguably be seen as permissible. But by and large, uh, derivatives are seen as hugely problematic um, within the Islamic finance world. Okay. And uh, suppose I were um, a bank or a private equity firm or a venture capital firm like yourself. Suppose I were to take on debt to buy an asset. How would that work? Suppose a bank were to engage in a leverage yeah. buyout. How would that work? So um, with, with private equity, um, you know, the, a debt is a really important component of the, of of the strategy. Um, and if you got that debt from an Islamic bank, that would be perfectly fine and you can do that. Um, and an Islamic bank would structure it either using a murabaha agreement, the type, you know, the 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 sale yeah. plus markup agreement that we talked about, or they might do it using uh, an asset and leasing model that we talked about with the home financing. Um, so there could be different strategies the Islamic bank would use. But ultimately, commercially for the private equity house, it would be seen as a loan that they have to pay back, and they're able to leverage up. Now, yeah. absent the use of Islamic finance in uh, a private equity fund that purports to be Sharia compliant, that's very problematic because then you can't do the leverage. And that means that leverage buyouts don't really work. Um, and so, you know, that's why we see very, very few Islamic private equity uh, funds globally. There's only a very small handful yeah. uh, in the Middle East and, uh, and they um, typically have good ties with Islamic banks. Let's talk about uh, the uh, geography first, and we'll get on to uh, investments now. So which countries, roughly, we don't have to list all of them, but you know, how many countries uh, does Islamic finance apply to? Um, so there's no countries that um, you know, dictate that you 100% must use Islamic finance, to the best of my knowledge. Perhaps maybe Afghanistan, I don't know. Right. Um, but the countries where they really support it, and it's a big player in the wider uh, you know, economy include uh, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, a number of the Gulf countries. Uh, Malaysia is a massive player when it comes to Islamic finance. Uh, Turkey, Pakistan, and Indonesia all have um, Islamic finance making up about 10 to 25 percent of uh, the financial sector. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's a number of countries. Actually, the UK is quite a big active player in the Islamic finance scene as well. It's in the top 10 uh, Islamic finance destinations globally. Wait, the key here is that you said that business does not is not mandated to be done by Sharia law in those countries. So if yeah. I want to transact yeah. through conventional means, I'm allowed to do that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. All right, I guess it's, that, okay, so you know, yeah. that's a clarification. I guess it's more for people who are practicing the Islamic faith who want to do this. Exactly. So okay. even in Saudi Arabia and you know, uh, Iran and places like that, they're right. perfectly possible to do conventional. Because I would imagine for a, an Islamic country like the UAE, for example, where, uh, you know, in Dubai, most of the population, well, most of the business population is expats, um, mandating Islamic banking on the expat community would be constraining, would it not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the UAE, de you know, definitely, um, you know, you can 100% do everything. Actually, the conventional finance is the mainstream there. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely within the majority. Um, but Islamic finance is a big, significant part of the ecosystem. In Saudi Arabia, I think, is the and Kuwait are the two countries where Islamic finance is much more prevalent, and you would expect that to be the standard. Uh, the, the, the large banks there are all, are all Islamic banks. Um, this is a challenge question that was submitted to me. Suppose, uh, you know, an economy were to be based on the Islamic finance model, wouldn't growth of that economy slow down relative to a conventional banking model? Because you're, you're restricting access to certain capital, you're restricting access to certain types of financial instruments, derivatives like we talked about. And so uh, the options where the, li the limitations placed on investors and traders are greater, therefore growth must be slower. Is that true? No, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, I think uh, it's a it's a deep question, um, and I think it goes back down to the nature of money, um, and you know what what has happened since we 
uh, decoupled from the gold standard back in the day. I mean, you guys at Kitco know this better than I, right? Um, you've had money that is now, and the money creation is now in the hands of banks and financiers because the debt that is issued is the way that money is created. Uh, and so in an Islamic economy, um, that would obviously not happen. And mm -hmm. so in an Islamic economy, you would typically, you know, you know, we've never really seen a pure Islamic economy, certainly since, you know, the, the decoupling of right. uh, gold from, the, from currency. I think, I think what would happen is you would have a public investment bank of sorts and the public investment bank, rather than, um, you know, new money being created by a HSBC or a Barclays bank um, and issuing conventional loans to their customers, this public investment bank would create new money and put that into infrastructure projects and other projects that are needed by, um, you know, from, from a, like a, from a government perspective. So that would be the way that new money enters into the economy. So um, I think it's a theory, it's a theoretical questions, but I, mm -hmm. but I think there's really effective ways of maintaining solid growth uh, with a, with an Islamic ecosystem. Right. And, and just going back to the definition one more time. Now, the Islamic country, is that defined by having a Muslim government uh, or is that just defined by simply having a country with a large population of Muslims? Like, you know, how do you how do you define an Islamic country? So I, I don't think uh, I think in, in this example, there is really no such country that exists right now. That is that pure it says purely that, look, right. we are only going to deal with you know, it's Sharia law, and we're not going to deal at all with conventional finance whatsoever. Okay. Not even countries like Saudi Arabia like that. So, you know, even it, it may be, um, you know, uh, surprising to folks, but Saudi Arabia and a lot of the Gulf countries, they are some of the biggest, uh, you know, shareholders mm -hmm. in conventional, conventional banks. So, um, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about almost like a right. theoretical situation. So I guess, Going back to your, what you said, I mean, even the UK, you can find Islamic banking. So it's whatever country that I guess has a significant Muslim population, you can find the system. That's right. More or less. That's All right. right. Um, from the investment standpoint, I understand there are certain assets or, you know, types of investments that are haram, meaning forbidden. Uh, can you explain what those are? Yeah. So um, pretty much every kind of uh, investment asset that you can think of has certain portions of it that would be haram and certain portions of it that would be halal or permissible. Um, so when it comes to stocks and shares, if you are um, investing in um, a gambling company or an alcohol company, that would of course be problematic. But then secondly, if you are investing or trading in a company that is excessively levered, that has too much debt, that is also seen as not permissible because you, know, you are then um, you know, inadvertently dealing with interest. Um, so Islamic funds have very rigorous screens that they apply to stocks mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, they actually invest just in those stocks that are permissible. So that's just in equity. Uh, and then the bond market as a whole is not allowed. So there are equivalent Islamic bonds called sukuk. So sukuk are issued by sovereigns or companies just like bonds are, but they are linked to um, certain assets that these governments or companies own, and they are giving a rental yield that is linked to whatever asset it is. So the government, the UK government actually issued a sukuk where they were leasing out a large government building and they were paying out the rent from it. And so, you know, for the government, it was a, um, it was a good transaction because it released a lot of liquidity, you know, by, by selling the asset. And then they, they could stage the repayment and the rental uh, over a period of time. All right. Uh, so I'll give you a few asset classes outside of stocks. So you've already listed a few sectors uh, that you cannot invest in gambling, alcohol, for example. I believe pornography yeah. is another one. Um, what yeah. about cryptocurrencies? Uh, cryptocurrencies, again, um, in, in um, principle, you know, the starting position with um, Islamic finances, the thing is permissible unless it is proven to be otherwise. And with cryptocurrencies, the same principle applies. Um, the kind of things that would not be allowed would be things like, let's say, compound or yearn finance or you know, those kind of DeFi um, projects where the, it is clear that interest and you know, the conventional banking kind of concepts are involved. Or you know, there are certain projects that are linked to 
um, you know, pornography, for example, that would be problematic. Um, and there, there are certain projects that are uh, linked to um, an element of gambling, that will be problematic. But by and large, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, I don't know, Filecoin, HBAR, there's so many different cryptocurrencies that are perfectly fine to, for, for the average person to invest in. Okay. Uh, what about precious metals, gold, silver, platinum? Uh, so precious metals, in principle, perfectly fine. Uh, it's okay. great. Um, but uh, there are some rules around that, as okay. always, right, David? It's never sure. simple. Uh, so um, the, the the idea with, with gold and silver and every, everything like that is you mustn't trade in it using derivatives. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, you can uh, magnify your returns by trading in derivatives and uh, you know, trading um, uh, with, uh, let's say, spread betting and, and the like, that is not that is not allowed. Um, the other key consideration when it comes to gold and silver is, let's say, an ETF, a gold ETF. Mm. Sometimes you have gold ETFs that actually hold the gold. Others uh, are using, um, you know, complex derivative and hedging strategies that are mimicking the holding of gold and silver those would not be permissible. So, you know, Muslims would typically want to hold actual gold or have, um, or have um, you know, shareholdings in funds and um, structures where there is actual gold being held. Uh, what about, okay, so shifting gears now, a central bank operating in an Islamic country, are they allowed to use uh, open market operations, intervene in the interest rates, uh, markets, uh, anything that the Federal Reserve can do, basically? Can an, can an Islamic central bank do the same? Um, so this goes back to the point about how there isn't really a purely Islamic country. Okay. Um, so actually, I guess the closest you could get is probably, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where it's very majority Muslim and they care about uh, Islam. Even there, the central um, bank is, is, is really just operating as a conventional central bank. I see. Um, and so um, the, the question really is a theoretical question is like, you know, in a country where it really was purely Islamic, sure. how would that work? Yeah. And I think that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't, I don't actually know um, exactly how things would play out. I guess it would depend on um, the, you know, going back to this public investment fund concept where the issuance of money is controlled by this uh, central bank or public investment fund, the, the rate, the base rate or the prime rate would be linked to the rate of money creation of right. this public investment fund. And that's how you, you know, control or dampen the, um, the, you know, the issuance of money through the ecosystem. Well, I guess also, theoretically speaking, uh, one of the roles of a central bank is to act as a lender of last resort. And so in an Islamic, in a purely theoretical Islamic country, uh, the lender of last resort in this case couldn't just give out money to other institutions and non-bank institutions, banks or non-bank institutions. And so in this case, it would probably be a government entity that would take ownership or partial ownership of whatever projects that people apply for, right? On a, on a larger institutional scale. It would be just the government's, it would just be like basically government owned entities um, participating in this. Yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's very, very possible. Yeah. And I think the other, um, the other tweak here is that um, there are, again, there are two schools here in the Islamic finance world. Certain people are unhappy about fractional reserve banking. Yes. So the concept of taking in deposits and then you know lending out more than the deposit. Um, so within the um, Islamic framework, that would be frowned upon. Um, and you know because of that, there's a just a lot less risk associated with a finance, you know, with a banking sector anyway. Um, and so the concept of a lender of last resort would become much much less important because there's much less you know lending happening that is. Uh, you know, not backed by currency or not backed by assets. Okay. All right. Finally, uh, let's talk about your work. So you're a venture capitalist. You're based in the UK. Um, tell us about some of the, uh, the investments you're looking at right now. Yeah. So uh, I run a, um, a fund called Curate.Capital, C-U-R and then the number eight. And we invest in early stage uh, companies, you know, typically pre-seed, seed, series A, um, where we're investing tickets of around 100,000 up to 500,000 um, pounds. And we, uh, we've invested in over 50 different companies now in all sorts of sectors, but our primary focus is FinTech and uh, those kind of businesses that use 
media or communities as a go-to-market because that's you know these are the strategies that we know well as um, you know the the company that I that I founded Islamic Finance Guru which is a a, a large Islamic fintech that's where you know we learned those kind of you know uh, uh, products and that's our background so it makes sense to, for us to invest in those kind of sectors ourselves now. Um, and it's been great fun. I think we've uh, we've had uh, a couple of exits now, and uh, we get to invest with some really cool co-founders and mm-hmm. really cool co-investors. People like you know the founders of Airbnb and Twitter and wow. Zoopla and Kazoo and various others. So okay, it's, well, uh, it keeps us keeps us entertained. Yeah, I'd love to have a separate discussion with you another time and talk about that space. That's a separate conversation. Finally, theoretical question: Could you do the same thing in Saudi Arabia? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Venture capital is, you know, there's very little debt involved. So it's, uh, there's a few t- tweaks that you might need to make to the, you know, the documents, but it's pretty much very compliant as it comes. All right. Fantastic. Ibrahim, that was very educational. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the show. No worries. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.